So for Math 98, we'd like to do examples from homework number 6. I'm going to be focusing on section 13.3, which covers the inverse function. These are like problems 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 on the homework. Okay, let's think about the function f of x equals 3 times x minus 2. If we describe this function in words, this means given an input x, what do you do? Well, you multiply by 3, and then you subtract 2. So for example, if I let x equals 2, then the first thing I'm going to do is multiply by 3 and get 3 times 2 equals 6. Then I take that answer and subtract 2 and get 4. What we'd like to do in this section is describe what we, we call an inverse function. This function undoes the operation of the given function. So our function f of x equals 3 times the input minus 2. In other words, we first multiplied by 3, and then we subtracted 2. To undo this, we're going to do the opposite of these operations in the opposite order. So if I want to undo the operation of first multiplying by 3 and then subtracting 2, I want to go backwards and do the opposite of subtracting 2, which is add 2, and then do the opposite of multiplying 3, which is divide by 3. If I want to write that in symbols, I take my number, I add 2, and I divide by 3. Now let's see if this works. I gave you the input 2 for my original function, 3x minus 2, and that gave me the output of 4. Let's see what happens when I put in the input of 4 into this function. If this is truly what we call the inverse, then it should give me, the output as the output, the value 2. So let's see what happens when I replace 4 for x. I get 4 plus 2 divided by 3. 4 plus 2 is 6. 6 divided by 3 is 2. So there you go. Let's take a bunch of values and see how this works. So I start with my original function, 3x minus 2. If I put in the value 2, we know that we get the value 4. If I put in the value 3 as my input, I get 3 times 3, which is 9, minus 2, which is 7, right? Put in the value 5, that's 3 times 5 is 15, minus 2 is 13. If I put in the value 0, I'll get 3 times 0, equals 0, minus 2 gives me minus 2. If we do the opposite now, if I take the output from these values, from f of x here, and I use those as the input for g of x, I should get these back as my values. Let's see if that works. So if I place 4 in for x here, I'm going to do 4 plus 2 divided by 3. 4 plus 2 is 6. 6 divided by 3 is 2. If I replace 7 in here, I have 7 plus 2 divided by 3. That's going to give me 9 divided by 3, and that's going to give me 3. If I have 13 here, 13 plus 2 divided by 3. 13 plus 2 is 15. 15 divided by 3 gives me 5. And minus 2 plus 2 divided by 3 gives you 0 divided by 3, which gives you 0. So you can see that this function, given these inputs, produce this outputs. If I take those outputs and use those as the inputs for this function, they give me the original numbers that I started with. So these two problems right here, these two functions here, are what we call inverse functions. Now we will have an algebraic way to do this in just a few minutes later in this video. But for right now, let's talk about the notation we use for input function, the inverse functions. If we are given a function f of x, for example, 3x minus 2, then we often write the inverse function as f to the negative 1 of x, which is x plus 2 over 3. So this notion means the inverse of the given function f. 
Don't let this notation confuse you. This does not mean 1 over f of x. It just means f inverse of x. It's just a name. Now, you might remember that functions can be given in three forms. They can be given as ordered pairs or as tables. They can be given as graphs. And they can also be given as algebraic functions. So let's look at how we find inverses when we're given each of these options. First of all, we're going to look at finding inverses when functions are given in tabular form. Here's a function where the input is this column and the output is this column. And you can verify, just for a moment, that this truly is a function. For each input, there's only one output, right? To find the inverse function is easy. All we do is switch the roles of input and output. So for the inverse, we're going to use these for the input. And since 5 was the output of 0, the output for 5 in the inverse function is 0. The output for, for 2 in the inverse function is 3. The output for negative 1 in the inverse function is 5. The output for 3 is 6. The output for negative 2 is 8. So this right here represents the inverse function given in a tabular form. Now, often we don't have a table, but we write these as ordered pairs. Now, if it's useful for you, you might go ahead and write these ordered pairs as a table, where we think about what are the inputs and what are the outputs. So here I have an input of 0, an output of 5, an input of 3, an output of 2, input of 5, an output of negative 1, input of 6, an output of 3, input of 8, an output of negative 2. So if we want the inverse, we just flip the inputs and outputs. We just change that. Okay, so for the inverse, I'm going to write down these inputs, 5, 2, negative 1, 3, negative 2. And the outputs, 0, um, 3, 5, 6, and 8. Now you'll notice that really all I'm doing to these ordered pairs is I am switching x and y. In the original function, x was 0 and y was 5. In my new function, x is 5 and y is 0. And the same thing here. Input was 3, output was 2. Here, input was 2, output was 3. Here, input was 5, output was negative 1. So that's negative 1, 5 in the inverse. Here, input is 6, output is 3. That's 3, 6. And here, Input is 8, output is negative 2, that's negative 2, 8. So it's very easy to do these problems. Here's an example from WebAssign. Name the ordered pairs that are in the inverse to this set. So here's a function. You can verify again that it's a function because each input has only one output. If I want to find the inverse as a set of ordered pairs, what do I need to do? Well. All I need to do is switch my inputs and outputs. So instead of 1, 1 half, I have 1 half, 1. Instead of 2, a quarter, I have a quarter, 2. Instead of 3, 1 eighth, I have 1 eighth, 3. And instead of 4, 1 sixteenth, I have 1 sixteenth, 4. So that is functions in tabular forms. Let's talk about inverse functions from a graph. OK, let's plot this function. 2x minus 2. Now you might remember this is a line with the y-intercept 0, negative 2, and then a slope of 2, so I would go up 1, 2, and over 1. And just for fun, I'm going to plot another point. I'm going to say, let's say 1. I'm going to go up 2 more, and that would be 2. So this would be 2, 4. So if we were to draw this, we would have a nice line through these three points, right? Now, if you think about what we did with the tabular function, 
the inverse, we're going to switch x and y. So to find the graph of the inverse, we're going to switch the roles of x and y. I'm going to use another color to draw my inverse. So instead of minus 2, instead of 0, minus 2, I'm going to use minus 2, 0. Okay, so I'll draw this in green. Minus 2, 0. And instead of 1, 2, I'm going to use 2, 1. Okay, just right there. And instead of 2, 4, I'm going to use 4, 2. Okay, so let's do 4, 2. All right, I'll try to draw that kind of carefully here. And if I've done a pretty good job, I have my function green here, which is my inverse function. Now you'll notice that these two functions are reflections in this line that goes right through the middle of these two quadrants, quadrant 1 and 4. That line is y equals x. So its function and its inverse on a graph, the input and out numbers, output numbers are swapped. They're reflections through the line y equals x. Let's take a look at this function and see if we can kind of draw something similar to that. So again, I'm just going to use my information I know about lines from Math 93, that g of x equals 1 half x minus 2. I'm going to start at minus 2, my y-intercept. I'm going to go up 1 over 2 for the next one, and go up 1 over 2 for another point. And I'm going to use this to help me draw this nice line right here. So this right here is my function g of x, which is 1 half x minus 2. Now these points here are 0 minus 2, 2, negative 1, and 4, 0. So on my inverse, I have to have the points minus 2, 0. And negative 1, 2, so I'm just switching x and y here, negative 1, 2. And 0, 4. Okay, so if I've done that, here is my function that is the inverse. And again, You'll notice these are reflections right through that line, y equals x. Now, it's important to note that not all functions have inverses. By that, I mean not all functions have inverses which themselves are functions. Let's look at a simple example, f of x equals x squared. From your work in Math 94, you should know that this is my function, f of x equals x squared. If you think about this, okay, here we have the points 0, 0, 1, 1, and negative 1, 1. If I just switch x and y, I end up with 0, 0, so same point there, 1, 1, same point there, and 1, negative 1, so 1, negative 1 would be down here. Now, this, you might remember, hey, wait a minute, this isn't a function. This green here is not a function because you have two, output, two outputs for the input 1. So if an original function has two answers that are the same for two different inputs, it does not have an inverse. The way to say that mathematically is in order for a function to have an inverse, each output must have a unique input. These functions, where each output has a unique input, are called one-to-one. -one. So this function here is not one-to-one, -one because it has two unique inputs, negative one and one, that give you the same output. While this function we used on the other page is one-to-one, 
because for any input, you're going to get a different output. A quick way to you to tell if you have a graph, if something is going to have an inverse, is something called the horizontal line test. For example, consider this function right here. This is a perfectly fine function. But if you can draw a horizontal line through the function, and it crosses the function more than once, then that means if you were to try to create an inverse, you would have multiple inputs, multiple outputs for these different inputs. So that would mean that you don't have an inverse. So if the horizontal line crosses the function more than once, then you do not have an inverse function. Let's do another one. Okay, let's try this one. Here's a function. You see this is a perfectly fine function. Does it have an inverse? The answer is no, because it does not pass the horizontal line test. It crosses it more than once. You can draw a line that crosses this more than once. So that means this does not have an inverse. Now finally, let's talk about how to find an inverse from an equation, algebraically. The process is simple. We're going to replace your function notation, f of x, with y. So I'm going to write y equals 3x minus 2. Number two, we're going to switch x and y. And with the resulting equation, we're now going to solve for y. So if I do this, I add 2 to each side. And then I divide by 3. This result is the inverse function. You might use inverse notation. If you were given f of x, I might use f inverse of x equals x plus 2 over 3. Now, notice this is the original problem I started with in this section in this video. And this was the formula we used for the inverse. So this verifies for us that these two are actually the inverse functions. So this undoes what this does. Let's do this one. This one doesn't start with f of x, so you can skip that first step and just switch x and y. Solving for y, I get x over 7 equals y. Now, is this the inverse? Well, think about this original function. The original function y equals 7 times x. You take a number, you multiply by 7, you get the answer. The inverse function, you would take that answer, divide by 7, you get back to the original number that you have. Why don't you take a moment and see if you can find this, find this inverse on your own. Okay, let's switch x and y. Add 5 to each side and then divide by 20. So this right here is the formula for the inverse function. Now you do have to be careful a little bit about whether these functions are one-to-one. -one. Each of these were lines, so they are one-to-one -one functions. They always have a different output for a given input. Now let's think about the cube root of x. The cube root of x, no matter what number I put in for x, I'm going to get a different answer. So solving here, switch x and y. How do I get rid of this cube root? Well, what I should do is cube each side. That gives me x cubed equals y. So these two are inverses. So let's now take a look at this one. y equals x to the 6. Just for fun, I'm going to graph that function for you. So I'll go over here, and I'll say x raised to the 6. And I'm going to graph that on a standard window. There it is. If you look at that graph, you'll notice it does not pass the horizontal line test. So you say, hey, wait a minute. I can't have an inverse. And you would be correct. However, often we restrict the domain. We make sure that I only use a part of the domain that would allow for an inverse to exist. If I let x be positive, this function, x to the 6, looks like this. And then, 
it would pass the horizontal line test. But you have to be a little bit careful. Here, x has to be positive. So I'm going to let switch x and y. And if you do this, you see that x to the 1 6 equals y to the 6 to the 1 6. So y equals x to the 1 6, or the 6th root of x. Now, the 6th root of x, just for fun, I'm going to graph that here. So I'm going to use the 6th root of x. And you might remember, um, you could do this. You say 6, then hit your math button, go down here, and then say x. And if I graph that, you'll notice that it only gives you that top half of that branch. So my original function, I restricted my domain to just be this positive part. Then this is my inverse here. And again, that fits that reflection through the line y equals x right there. So sometimes you have to be careful about this. Let's take a look at this one. This function, if you were to graph it, looks something like this. We could graph this on our graphing calculator, but this is what my function would look like. In other words, the domain is x is greater than 4, and the range is y is greater than or equal to 0. Now, let's take a look at this. Let's switch x and y. How do you get rid of the square root? Well, you square both sides. Okay, so I square both sides. That gives you x squared equals y minus 4. And that gives you x squared plus 4 equals y. But this, you have to be careful, is not my inverse function. Because x squared plus 4, you know, is the entire parabola, right? And this is only half of a parabola right here. So what we would say is that in an inverse, the domain and range are opposite from what they were in the original function. In other words, the range here was y is greater than or equal to 0. That means the domain here is x is greater than or equal to 0. And the domain in the original function was x is greater than or equal to 4. So the range is y is greater than or equal to 4. Now, if you think about that, if I were to draw this, this would give me this half of that parabola. x is greater than or equal to 0, y is greater than 4, and that looks like the inverse of that. So you have to be careful again. So remember, the domain of a function is the range of its inverse, and the range of a function is the domain of its inverse. I hope you have found this video useful.